Do you see everything? Yes, yes, Doctor. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, what, what I try to do with you guys is what I do with my residents. So I just got fresh questions for the board, kind of board review style uh, cases. Anybody who is planning to come to this country and sit for any exam, these are the type of questions you should face because they don't care which part of the world you are at. All right, this is case number one. How do you want me to do? Me read the question or I need a volunteer from the audience? Is that possible? And we go around, is that okay with you guys? Okay, no problem. All right. Uh, we'll start. Question one, a six month old child has roseola. For that child's immunologically normal father and pregnant mother, both of whom have no health problems, which of the following would be likely to occur if they acquire the etiological agent of Rosiella? Choose one, fever and uh, choices, meningoencephalitis in mother or father, meningoencephalitis in mother only, spontaneous abortion, no significant pathology except for perhaps mild fever. Okay, I'll give you a second. I'm going to go then to the answer and explanation. Any idea? Um, actually, no. Nobody in the audience? No, it's okay. No significant pathology except for perhaps mild fever. And you can read the rationale, please. Rosella is caused by human herpes virus 6. It usually occurs during childhood and results in generally mild self limited illness, which present either as Rosella infantum or febrile seizures without rash. Rosella infantum is often diagnosed by pediatrician clinically based on several days of high fever, followed by rash, uh, as, the, as the child defervices, although serologic and PCR testing are available. Seroprevalence rates are usually over 70%, so most children acquire this infection. Possible disease association with the human herpes virus 6 in immunocompetent adults are not proven other than a few cases of primary infection. Primary infection in adults is rare, and thus neither parent is likely to have any manifestation if they acquired primary infection. A few cases of encephalitis, mistotemporal epilepsy, and mononucleosis type syndrome have been reported, but they appear to be rare. For heavily immunosuppressed patients, such as hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipient, cases of encephalitis are being reported from many institutions. Okay, good. All right, next question. Uh, 19 year old female was brought to the emergency room by police after being raped by several men at the bar T earlier that evening. She complained of vaginal and rectal pain. She did not know the men who raped her, but knew that some of them had been shooting up in a room at the bar. She had never been tested for HIV and extremely concerned about having been infected by the rape. She asked if she can be given drugs to prevent acquisition of HIV as well as the morning after pill. In addition to testing her for HIV and other sexual transmitted disease, your approach to this question is which of the following observation in within in two days, HIV through will be available, uh, offer one week regimen of tenofovir, uh, plus emitriptis, and Sabine uh, offer single dose of uh, a triple, uh, triple antiviral to be taken now, offer four week antiretroviral regimen, offer six months antiretroviral regimen, four weeks regimen. Four weeks? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Sorry, this is a long uh, rationale. You know, if you guys want to read it for one minute, uh, it's fine with me. Okay. Patients who have a non-occupational exposure to HIV either known or highly likely 
the past seven two hours are candidates for four week regimen using one of several regimens recommended for therapy of HIV infected individual. Clinics that can do the rapid test for HIV on saliva find it useful to check for pre existing HIV. The patient has had high risk behavior. Although the exact, the exact window of time in which antiretroviral prophylaxis is effective remains unknown. Evidence points to starting prophylaxis as soon as possible, and ideally within 72 hours based on animal data. Waiting until HIV serology tends to begin anti antiretrovirals is not recommended. The correct answer is three drug regimen uh, for, by, for four weeks. This patient has asked for morning after build, so pregnancy issues are not relevant. However, uh, as an FGI, what is the FYI? For your information. Uh, yeah, uh, there was brief concern about neural use defects in pregnant women receiving a DTG. Okay. Yeah, However, no, no worries about these abbreviations, it's just the whole idea. However, the current HHS guideline indicate that a, a DTG is a preferred and retroviral drug for using during pregnancy, a respective trimester, and for, for people who are trying to conceive. Regimens that a, use Darunavir, uh, Ritonavir, and Raltigravir. There are a integrase inhibitor and nucleoside uh, inhibitors and non nucleoside reverse transplant inhibitor, right? Okay. Uh, or the lithium gravir are among those recommended based on lack of drug resistance in the community in combination with tenofovir, uh, emetricidectabine. Integrase inhibitors are generally more convenient and better tolerated than protease inhibitors. Uh, TDF is recommended over a TAF because of the planned short duration of drug exposure. Single or dual drug regimens are undesirable because of the possibility that the acquired virus are, is already resistant or that the acquired virus will become resistant in therapy. HIV infection can be acquired without mucosal breaks, though trauma increases the risk. Keep in mind management of other STDs, including attached B virus. In the center of CDC recommend empiric antibiotic prophylaxis for STDs as well as HIV prophylaxis. The risks are substantial for chlamydia infection, reversion of 16%, building fermentary disease and bacterial vaginosis. Trichomoniasis and direct therapy with ceftriaxone and azithromycin or equivalent drug will cover these pathogens. Worst exposure is but hepatitis B vaccine is also recommended. So 72 hours is the important number, uh, four weeks, and uh, consider treatment for possible STDs. So that's really the first of this question. Uh, I think this is a tough one for you. I'm gonna just let's uh, try. A 53 year old uh, HIV infected male on long term first regimen of uh, Ivaverens, Kinovavir, Emetrisatavin. It's okay. I okay. cannot even pronounce them. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. With excellent biologic control. Uh, viral load less than uh, 50 copies, CD is about 600, was admitted to the trauma center after gunshot wound to his abdomen. His anti uh, antiretroviral drugs were not started in the hospital since he was taking nothing by mouth for most of the three weeks he was there. Uh, his, um, okay, his regimen was started at discharge. Okay. Okay, uh, three months after the discharge from the hospital, he was eating well and uh, regaining his weight and had the following lab result. Viral load was uh, uh, 3,500 scobies with CD count uh, of uh, 495 cells. Uh, he was 
he, he said to state that he has been adherent to his antiretroviral drug since discharge. Which the following resistant mutations are most likely to be detected in the patient on his current regimen? Uh, I don't have an idea. Yeah. You know, I don't think at your level uh, you're going to get these questions. This is just for infectious disease boards. The answer is C, it's K103N and or M184V. I even studied them only for the board. So uh, we can skip this question. We'll get you more. Here you go. Maybe this is the last one on HIV. The old male in excellent health presence because he is concerned about a high risk sexual exposure six days ago. He was tested three months and six months ago for HIV and was seronegative. He has no symptoms. Which of the following is likely to give the earliest evidence of HIV infection in this patient? A. Which one? Which one to vote? A, A, A. Anybody else? We all... That's not the correct answer, no. Okay. IgM? All right, um, it's B, and, uh, this is the explanation. If the signs and symptoms of acute uh, HIV infection sorry, appear six to 56 days after exposure from day zero. Viremia can be detected as early as four days post exposure by BCR of plasma. HIV RNA nucleic acid test becomes positive approximately five days before P24 antigen and one to three weeks prior to measurable antibody formation. Current HIV 1 and 2 serologists detect both IgM and IgG antibodies, but antibodies typically appear 22 to 27 days post-infection after symptoms have resolved and peak viral titers were obtained. Viral loads typically exceed 1 million copies at its peak, Viral loads less than 1,000 copies per mil should be viewed with suspicion as possible false positives in the setting of a seronegative individual. I didn't individual. understand that. CD4 enumeration is neither sensitive nor specific for early diagnosis of anti-acute retroviral infection. Post exposure prophylaxis with antiretroviral therapy should be a consideration for this patient, though he is beyond the 72 hour window period, then reflex is like the most effective based animal studies. Thank you. All right. Uh, a six, six year old physician in Maryland in, in otherwise excellent health has seen COVID assault during a coffee break at large medical meeting. His boss found to be 28, which speeds up over the next few minutes as he regains consciousness. In the emergency room, his com in complete heart block Temporary transvenous pacemaker is inserted to increase heart rate uh, to 60. The ER physician uh, astutely elicits the history that the physician likes, likes to garden in Maryland's sub, uh, sober, sober ban. Sober and okay. and, right. and the ball takes off from time to time. Over the past few weeks, he has been feeling fatigue with muscle aches. He started an oral dexacline two, two days earlier. A, the Borrelia burgdorferi ELISA is positive and subsequently triggered Western blocks to return positive for both IgM and IgG antibody. You are called for infectious disease advice as part of the pre op evaluation at the evening before permanent pacemaker schedules to be inserted. He is still in complete heart block and his man based ventricular rate still 14 day two hospitalization. The patient is alert and oriented, making urine. He felt he feels fine. To find nothing remarkable on his exam or in his routine pre op labs. Uh, he has a heart block due, due to Lyme disease. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Uh, we should switch to a uh, soft track zone. Uh, but about pacemaker. That's the crucial point in this question. You know, this is Lyme carditis. Uh, this the is patient uh, has heart block. What yes, to do? Citraxone is correct, but yeah. the other part of the question is 
Pacemaker or no pacemaker? pacemaker. You should go for Berman pacemaker. pacemaker. Oh, is... Anybody else? <laughs> I did not like the answer. Uh, I think it's reversible. So, so pacemaker might be deferred. Okay. All right. Excellent. Sometimes the cardiologists are in a rush, but in these cases, you know, patient condition is stable and uh, we can wait. Awesome. You see, this is the rationale. So, uh, you know, this is a learning experience. About one day, percent of reported patients with untreated Lyme disease will develop clinically significant carditis. This carditis manifests as varying degrees of blood. Third, second, and third degree heart blood can occur and be resistant or intermittent. The myocardium may, may be inflamed if gallium scan or heart waves is done, but these are usually not indicated. Myocarditis or, or the development of cardiomyopathies occurs infrequently. Complete heart blood results on average of six days after initiation of antibiotics, in the range of one day to many weeks. These are degrees of heart blood may continue for up to six weeks. Permanent pacemakers should not be placed routinely and are only required in rare circumstances, typically in older patients. There is no robust evidence indicating that ciftrexone is better than doxycycline. Still, most recommendations favor ciftrexone for symptomatic heart blood worthy of hospitalization until there is an improvement. The course of therapy may be completed with an, with an oral drug such as doxycycline. Corticosteroids have no known no rule in treating Lyme disease. All right, understood? Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 46 year old uh, previously healthy patient comes to you for advice about a tick that she had found in her, in the, uh, in her scalp uh, two days ago during May. Uh, she placed the tick in a bottle uh, for you to view. The patient uh, lives in uh, coastal uh, Connecticut. Okay. And uh, concerned about uh, preventing Lyme disease. What's the fact about the patient is best support the use of single dose doxycycline prophylaxis? Uh, the tick is. Uh, Derma Center, Dr. The tick is uh... That's another species. The tick is an exodistic that has been a test to no more than five hours. The tick is an engorged nymph species, is not certain, found in the hair and has been in place for unknown period. The Lyme IgG serology is positive on the day of the visit. The tick is tiny and does not appear in course. You know, we are in the middle of the season of these illnesses. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. the, the tick should be in contact with the skin for a period to cause the disease. Uh, I don't yeah. know. You know, they are not giving you the period here. That's a good point, excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, number two. Well, the tick is actually the stick that has been attached for no more than five hours. Mm. But they are not telling you that the tick is engorged or something, right? So, uh, you know, this is one study was published years ago in the New England about this kind of situation, which people really face on daily basis in their office, in the urgent care. So somebody comes with the tech, found the tech, you know, and, and what to do in this situation. So uh, they put criteria when you really need to act on these cases. So let's go by what the, the dermacenter tick does not transmit Lyme, okay? okay. The actually the tick is the is the is the uh, the one. Yes. Uh, for no more than five hours. So five hours really does not transmit Lyme disease. The tick is engorged nymph. The nymph is the second stage of the uh, tick, all right? And it is the most notorious, the most infectious. And it is engorged. When it is engorged, 
this means it's been there for more than 24 hours, 36 hours. If somebody has a Lyme IgG serology is positive, this is an old thing because you don't get positive serology in the same day. This takes at least four weeks. The tick is tiny and does not appear in gorge. So it hasn't been there for, for uh, it's, it's not been there long enough to really uh, cause a disease. So the only indication in this is, is number three, the tick is an engorged nymph, okay, found in the hair and has been placed for a known period of time. So we don't know how long, but it is engorged. The key word here is it is engorged, which means has been there for a while. Okay. All right. These are the criteria. You know, don't be surprised if you sit for this test that you will have such a question because this is an established fact. So it is a standard of care. All right. So let's read the rationale and uh, keep going. The criteria for giving a single dose of dococycline to prevent Lyme disease are as follows. Tick bite should be judged high risk. Attached tick identified as an adult or nymphal scapularis black leg tick that transmits Lyme disease, also capable um, of a transmitting body. Okay. Uh -huh. go, go ahead. Okay. A human granulocyte anaplasmosis. Tick is estimated to have been attached for uh, 36 hours or more, or based upon how engorged the tick appears. Antibiotic treatment begins within 72 hours of tick removal. The local rate of tick infection with Borrelia burgdorferi is 20% or more. The person can take doxycycline, no contraindications such as pregnancy or breastfeeding. Uh, the tick can, uh, dermatitis ticks can transmit the diseases to uremia, but not Lyme disease. Will rem, will uh, fever. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, you can even find this criteria in up to date or whenever there is. Uh, updated, updated review of Lyme disease. Uh -huh. Okay, you know, uh, this is how you remove the tick. Yeah, I think we should go for, further. Uh, ticks should be removed with the tweezers or other way that minimizes the squeezing tick content into the wound. However, answer B is wrong because it was not in place long enough to transmit Lyme disease regardless of how the tick was removed. The fourth choice is wrong because the patient has not had time to develop an antibody response Therefore, positive IgG immunoblot to Borrelia burgdorferi probably reflects an earlier infection. Typically, the incubation period for erythema migrants takes seven to 10 days to develop around infected tick bites. If the first tear screening ELISA is positive, Western blot IgM antibodies typically develop seven to 14 days to manifest, while IgG antibodies take longer, forming sufficiently two to six weeks after the acquisition. This patient IgG must be related to a prior exposure if it's a true positive, since insufficient time has passed to develop a de novo response. Precise identification of tick species is difficult, is difficult without training. Although clinical trials have used the criteria that include identification of ticks, this is not usually feasible given a commercial, commercial lab turnaround within a 72-hour time frame from the bite for the doxycycline reflex to be effective. Tick identification can be accomplished by submitting the specimen to a commercial lab. Another resource for tick identification includes university. Answer C remains the choice closest to the criteria outlined above. Okay. Understood? Yeah. Yes. All right. A 55-year-old nurse comes to you because he would prefer to get to the seasonal influenza live virus vaccine rather than the killed by a vaccine because he hates needles. He works in a cancer hospital in the stem cell transplant unit. He's known to have chronic bronchitis with occasional exacerbations of acute bronchitis. Which of the following would you advise regarding the, the live uh, seasonal influenza vaccine? Choose one. A. He should get the, the live vaccines and continue working. B, he should get the live vaccines but not work at the first week after vaccination. C, he should not get the, li the live vaccines because he has chronic bronchitis. D, he should not get the live vaccines because uh, it is no longer recommended for adults over the age of 48, 49. 
but he should uh, definitely get the, the inactivated influenza vaccine. Um, a, a live vaccines and continue working. Mm, they disagree with you. Maybe uh, he take off uh, for uh, for one week. Oh, mm -mm, I think they disagree with you. All right. Anybody else? <laughs> you know. Okay. You want to read the rationale? Yes. Uh, starting with with the recent with a recent season, uh, 2019, the nasal spray flu vaccine has been approved for the use in non-pregnant individuals, two years through uh, 49 years of old of, of age. People with certain medical conditions should not receive the nasal spray influenza vaccines. These include those who with a history of severe allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine or to a previous dose of any influenza vaccine, or children uh, two years old through 17 years, old, years of age who are receiving uh, aspirin or uh, salicylate containing medications, immune-compromised compr immune individuals, uh, children two years through four years who have asthma or who have had a history of wheezing in the past 12 months, and people who have taken influenza antiviral drugs within the previous 48 hours. In addition, there is a tiny risk of transmission of the live virus to immunocompromised patients in the week after vaccination. Chronic bronchitis in adult uh, is not co a contraindication to the live uh, virus vaccine, but it's, it's a good reason to, the vac to be vaccinated against influenza. Thus, this person should get the inactivated vaccine in order to reduce the likelihood, uh, the likelihood uh, he will suffer from influenza morbidity and to reduce the likelihood of transmitting influenza to his contacts, including his patients. All right. Sounds good? Sounds good, yes. All right. This is a good one. Let's go, my, one of my favorites. A 27-year-old man is brought by ambulance to the emergency room. His mother came home at the end of her work day and found him delirious on the living room couch. When she touched him, he was burning up, and she called for emergency service. In the emergency room, his temperature is 103.4, his heart rate is 132, and his blood pressure is 88 over 56 milligram millimeter uh, mercury. He is not responsive to commands and mumbles incoherently. He has no, uh, an abdominal scar that his mother reports is due to splenectomy, the results of trauma from a motorcycle accident when he was 19 years old. There is a deep abrasion on his right lateral cult that was erythematous but not permanent. His mother reports that he scraped his leg five days ago when he slipped and fell off a stone wall while helping her plants bring flowers. He also had an encounter with a stray dog that, that bit him when he tried to move the dog out of his yard. The patient is up to date with, uh, on his vaccination. His wife is, uh, is uh, 24 uh, with 19 pan forms. The lab calls to say that uh, they think these moderate shaped bacteria on the wet stained blood smear. His illness is most likely due to which of the following choose one strep, haemophilus, influenza, vibrio, or cabinocytophagia. Canimorsis. Yes. Morsis. Yeah. Yeah. Cytophaga canimorsis. So this is a 27-year-old man splenectomized with a dog bite. Yes. So. D. Which one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Just pay attention here. So patients who are spinectomized are prone to have severe illness when they have a dog bite. Uh, if you've seen it once, you will never forget it. I don't know how much you deal with dog bites in your area, but uh, pay attention to this. Patients who are spinectomized, patients who are immune suppressed, patients who are in immune suppression, 
they can have severe sepsis. So this will be rational. This is very, very favorite, favorite question in the boards. All right, here you go. Look by septicemia is a rare but highly lethal infection caused by capnocytophagia canemorosis or capnocytophagia sando producing overwhelming sepsis and or meningitis. Is clinic patients or those with heavy alcohol use who are bitten by a dog or who have a wound leg by a dog are most often affected. There is high grade bacteremia and bacteria may be seen on peripheral blood smears even without gram stain. Strep pneumonia and hemophilus influenza may cause overwhelming sepsis post splenectomy, but the roots seen on peripheral smear are not consistent with pneumococcus. Hemophilus influenza bacteremia is quite rare in adults. Neither pneumococcus nor hemophilus is associated with once or dog contact. The epidemiology here is not consistent with vibrio infection, no water contact, no shellfish ingestion. Pasteurella canis is much less virulent than multicida, often yeah. thought as part of complex flora and affected dog bite once, but rarely causes bacteria. Strep monophilus is associated with rat, not dog bites. Keep in mind that fulminant sepsis in asplenic patient is classically caused by encapsulated organism, including strep pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitis. Severe capnocytophagia and Bordetella hormones sepsis are also associated with splenectomy, as are babiosis and malaria. Of course, patients who are scheduled for splenectomy or who have urgent splenectomies should be immunized against meningococcus, hemophilus, and pneumococcus. Antibacterial prophylaxis is generally not given to adults following splenectomy. Excellent. You got the idea? Yes. You know, I have seen cases, no dog bites, but the patients have really, uh, they cuddle with their dogs. So uh, I have seen pastorella canis cystic arthritis. And basically the patient had surgery on that knee and had a visiting dog from her daughter to her house. And she came with fever and both the blood cultures and the cultures from the joint were positive for uh, canis. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you don't need a dog bite. You need to have a contact with the dog saliva in the right circumstances. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, uh, let's see here. All right. Question five. You are consulted to see a patient who recently underwent resection of a solitary pulmonary nodule. The patient is an is a 85, uh, 58 year old nurse who recently from North Carolina to Ohio and began a new job as a case of manager in a hospital. She was completely without symptoms. Her last chest X-ray was 18 years. Uh, earlier and was normal. She eats sushi and on weekends prior to her move, volunteered to, for many years at a dog shelter. Because of her age and a 42 year of history of cigarette smoking, she had resection of the nodule. The reason, the reason for the infectious disease consultation is that the pathology of the nodule revealed a worm with a muscularis layer surrounded by granulomatosis reaction. The nodule was most likely due to which of the uh, which one of the following? Choose one. A echinococcus, B and Sika and Nisac case, C toxoplasma, and Nisacus, and Nisacus, C toxoplasma, D strongloids, E derophilaria, A echinococcus. No, that's a nodule, doc. Echinococcus is, is, is echinococcus, it's a cyst. Uh, probably you see more cases than we see here. Muscular layers surrounded by granulomatous reaction. If you talk about echinococcus, they will tell you that the daughter yeah, cyst has a different uh, pathological findings. D, strongloids. No. All right. Tropical uh, parasitology is an important topic. So, uh, 
Tyrofilaria Okay, let's go further on this question. Uh, how do you get Echinococcus? Hydatid disease, how do you get it? I'm gonna just spend some time on this question. You live in the middle, in the Middle East, and you see a lot of hydatid disease, correct? Yes. I have seen a lot in Jordan, I'm telling you. I have seen it in the, every organ of, of, of the human body. By eating dog poop, okay? Because that's the dog tape worm, right? And yes. humans are not the normal host, the normal intermediate host. So you eat the egg, so you develop cysts. Depends where that larvae resides after hatching, right? And he said, uh, you know, she eats sushi, but this uh, fluke really attaches to the stomach. If you eat a sushi that is not being treated, you know, when you do sushi, the fish has to be frozen at least 24 hours at a degree of 180, minus 180 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Toxoplasma is not typical of toxoplasmosis, okay? That's a different kind of, uh, this is a nodule. Toxoplasma does not cause nodules. And it is benign in the human, in, in the normal host, but in patients who are immune compromised can cause other problems. Strongyloides, this is not the case, you know, does not reside in the lung. This is uh, a gut uh, parasite that can cause severe disease immune compromised patients. Diarofilari is the dog heartworm, okay? So that's the rationale, if you want to read it, it's long, okay? Okay? Okay. Yes. Diarofilari as a dog heartworm may present as a solitary nodule in a human. The infective L3 larval forms are typically transmitted by mosquito bites to dog in which they migrate to the right heart and pulmonary artery. Humans can also be infected by the bite of, mosquito, of a mosquito, but the larva cannot develop into mature worms. The larva died and uh, are embolized to the lung, including a granulomatous reaction that often results in a peripheral lung nodule. The diagnosis is most often made in, in humans when a nodule is resected and the worm is seen on histology. No drug therapy is indicated. Note that both the emetis and, and uh, rhythms are endemic in the United States. Diphilaria emetis is present in all uh, 48 contig uh, con contiguous states and, in, and is the species that typically causes pulmonary nodules in humans. While rare in people, there have been, there have been several case reports of diphilaria emetis occurring in the states along the eastern seaboard. In contrast to diaphilaria emetis, diaphilaria ribbons are more commonly present as a subcutaneous nodule. Echinococcus may cause asymptomatic lung infection, but typically produces cystic disease. And it's, and I say, and it's it is a roundworm that can cause human GI illness following ingestion of raw fish, such as sushi. It does not usually cause disease outside the GI tract. Cyst and tachyzoids of toxoplasma, a single cell and a single cell the protozoan, do not resemble worms and have no muscular structure. Strongyloids larva migrate through the lung. They can cause patchy pulmonary infiltrates or in the setting of hyperinfection syndrome, a diffuse infiltrate. However, they do not characteristically form solitary nodules in the lungs. All right. Uh, how much time we have since we started late? Uh, how much time? Can we go the full hour? Uh, we have to, uh, around 10 minutes, doctor. Okay, just let me know when to stop. Go ahead. In February, a 35-year-old man is seen in the New York City Emergency Department complaining of blurred and double vision that began around 12 hours earlier. 
About six hours ago, he developed weakness of his arms and now feels that his legs are st uh, starting to give out. He also feels like it is getting hard to breathe. He says he was fine until 12 hours earlier. He admits daily injections of heroin with, uh, with last use the day prior to admission. He lives in a city uh, apartment, has had no travel, and all of his food comes from the local supermarket. Ten days earlier, he went to a shooting gallery where he injected a new shipment of black tar heroin subcutaneously because he couldn't hit his usual vein. He has had no GI symptoms. He is afebrile and, and has a normal heart rate and blood pressure. His puncture site is tender, but not uh, fluctuant. Uh, his pupils are dilated, but equal. Cranial nerves three, four, and the six uh, uh, pulses are present bilaterally. There is no demonstra uh, demonstrable weakness in his extremities with arms weaker than legs. There is no sensory deficit. His illness is most consistent with which one, one of, the follow, uh, of the following? Botulism, tick paralysis, Gambare syndrome, tetanus, or Mycenae gravies. Uh, botulism, ah. Oh. The okay, 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 okay. Excellent. All right. Uh, the acute onset of cranial nerve abnormalities and progressive descending paralysis is typical of botulism. Most cases in adults are due to ingestion of preformed toxins in contaminated food, but cases may also follow infection with the, a wound with clostridium botulinum uh, with subsequent in vivo toxin production. The incubation period for wound botulism is longer than for foodborne diseases for foodborne disease and averages about 10 days. Wound botulism uh, cases have increased dramatically in the United States. Most have been associated with injection subcutaneously or intramuscularly of heroin. Wounds are often unimpressive. Abrasions, surgical incisions, and abscesses have been described. Most cases of wound botulism have involved injection drug, uh, drug users, particularly those using black tar heroin, by the subcutaneous or intramuscular, uh, not intravascular route. Inhaled cocaine can also cause botulism due to sinus infection. Right? Tick paralysis would be extremely unlikely in midwinter in an urban uh, dweller. Gambare syndrome is an ascending paralytic disease. Tetanus produces severe and painful mu muscle spasm, not progressive paralysis. Cranial nerves are not involved. The acute onset of illness and progressive descending weakness are not consistent with Marcinia. All right. Sounds good. Uh, yes. I think, Doctor, we can have another uh, one question. If you... Okay, here you go. Okay. It will be our last question, inshallah. I have 500 questions. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. There are 22 questions. So uh, next time I'm going to do a lecture. We can do this intermittently if you like. Okay, okay, inshallah. A 77 year old woman with insulin dependent diabetes is seen for four days of severe right ear pain. The pain is worsened by chewing. She has no previous history of ear problems and has not had fever. She says that the ear feels wet and that there is yellow stain on her pillowcase in the morning. In examination, she is afebrile. The penai appear normal and symmetrical, but tugging of the right external ear produces pain. The right ear canal appears moist and is partially occluded by heaped up granulation tissue. The part of the tympanic membrane that can be seen is normal. There is no mastoid tenderness and hearing is grossly normal. There is mild facial nerve palsy on the right side. The rest of the exam is unremar uh, unremarkable, except for the sequelae of diabetes. Then the uh, culture results. Which one, um, which one of the following antimicrobial is most appropriate for this patient? Okay, first of all, what do you think is the diagnosis? If you don't know the diagnosis, it's really it's not going to lead you to the correct answer. Uh, who's the host? You know, infectious disease, think who is the host and what the host has been doing. She's diabetic, right? Yes. yes malignant hepatitis external. Hepatitis external. Excellent. Okay. And in diabetics, it could be malignant, right? Severe. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, caused by pseudomonas infection, most likely. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, so 
Ciprofloxacin. All right. Okay. Uh, malignant. Why with this question? <laughs> okay. So malignant external otitis, also called malignant otitis externa, is an invasive infection of the external auditory canal and skull base, which typically occurs in elderly patients with diabetes mellitus. So the manus aeruginosa is nearly always the responsible organism. Patients with malignant external otitis classically present with ear drainage and severe otalgia, which are not responsive to topical antibiotics used to treat simple external otitis. With pro progressive infection, osteomyelitis of the base of the skull and the temporomandibular joint can develop. Progression of the osteomyelitis can be associated with cranial nerve palsies, most frequently the facial nerve. Of the antimicrobial choices, the only systemic agent with antisodominal activity is ciprofloxacin, which has become the drug of choice for this infection. Mucormycosis, even in the presence of diabetes mellitus, would be extraordinarily rare as a cause of otitis externa. Other molds would be unlikely in the absence of immunosuppression, so amphotericin B would not be indicated. Okay, excellent job. I'll uh, see when I can schedule another lecture. Uh, Doctor, Doctor, yes. في عنا في المستشفى ID specialist اسمه دكتور علي السبتين. بصراحة حكينا له إن أنت حين تعطينا محاضرات وكذا أمور كويسة. فحابب يسأل إذا يعني عندك مشكلة لو أعطينا رقمك على اساس انه في حالات احيانا مستعصي وما كنا يعني كثير عارفين نعمل فيها. My pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. I, I am really have no issues. Okay. I'm not coming to Palestine this year, but my wife, Dr. Najmi, well, and if she has time, I will ask her to come and drop by and uh, give you a visit. So she's going to be in Nablus and Ramallah. Okay. All right, she will be my uh, if she has time, because our time is limited. Uh, okay. Uh, if anybody is interested to come here or needs an interview, you know, uh, they can contact me and uh, I do most of the interviews. And uh, we take J1 and we would like to have, we are a very diverse program and we would love to have Anyone who is interested, okay? Allah, shukran. Okay. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Hala hala. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran.